ready? All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together this morning on a day like this one, just a time to relax and rejoice and to be re-energized, washed over by the word of truth, Father. What a grace gift this is. Father, your grace sustains us, even motivates us. We pray for continued humility and increased faith. Father, we pray for those in the congregation that can't be with us this morning. We want them to know that we're with them in spirit as family members. We miss them as brothers and sisters in Christ. And we pray to you for their healing in your good timing, of course. We are most grateful and thankful, of course, for your son's work on the cross to cancel out that debt that was against us. And for that, we are forever grateful, Father. We're just humbled by it. We do just ask, as well, for blessings on this morning's message. May it be edifying for our souls. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Again, part three of the introduction to God's salvific plan. So, last minute entry uh, in this message. I'll start this way with a story. A starving wolf comes upon a freshly mauled sheep in the woods. Does the wolf choose to eat the sheep? Why? The answer is yes, of course. Why? Because that's its very nature. A sheep comes upon a mauled sheep in the woods. Does the sheep choose to eat the other sheep? Why not? That's not its nature. It has a desire to eat grass, not other sheep. So let's suppose the wolf represents our flesh when we are born, as we are born into this world. Why do we choose to sin, to consume, if you would, lusts of the flesh. Why do we choose that route? Because it's our very nature to do so. In fact, we are bounded to our very nature. We are bounded to that nature. Is it our personal decision to make said choices? Of course. Of course. So, is it fair to say that both the wolf and our flesh have so-called free will to eat or do that which it is so inclined to? Is it fair to say that both the wolf and our flesh have a so-called free will to do that which it is so inclined to do? Yeah. Yeah. You see, we have an irresistible urge to do whatever we are naturally inclined to do. It's irresistible to us. That's what we are naturally inclined to do. In fact, we have never once done something outside of our so-called free will. In other words, you choose as you will choose. Otherwise, that would mean we acted against our nature, which is intrinsically impossible. 
So we have never once done something outside of our so-called free will. And someone might say, you know, in all fairness, well, what if a policeman says, you can't do that, even though you want to? You would choose to do that. But you don't. So what about that case? What if a policeman says you can't do that, even though you want to, and so you don't? Is that a breach of your free will? Not at all. Not at all. You simply chose between sticking to your original plan and going to jail. But you still chose. In the end, you still chose. Fair enough? Okay. In this case, you chose self-preservation over some other desire to do something else. But the point is that you still chose whatever your nature was so inclined to choose. Another person might say, oh, well, what about when a wolf really wants to eat all of the sheep it finds? but it allows other wolves to join in. Shouldn't that wolf be, you know, commended for doing something good? Yeah, join in. Shouldn't that wolf be commended for doing something good in that moment? It is good in the sense that the first wolf knows that wolves being pack animals, have a better chance of survival as individuals if they all survive as a pack. Okay, how'd they get in? Come on in. No, no worries. Uh, Usher, uh, Don, can you help him? Why is that door not locked? Give him a, a sheet that they can read to understand protocol. Good timing, huh? Any surprises? None. Welcome, gentlemen, but you got to be here on time. Normally that door is locked. Fair enough? Okay, thank you. So where were we? Oh, the question. Shouldn't that wolf be commended for sharing the feast with other wolves? Isn't that a good thing, so to speak? And again, it's good in the sense that the first wolf knows that wolves are pack animals and they have a better chance of survival if they all survive. In this sense, the wolf is still self-serving, still exercising a free will decision. Why? Again, because that's its nature. That's its very nature. Now that's analogous, in that instance, to a so-called good unbeliever. In the end, what the Bible teaches us is that the human flesh helps others for as long as it can conceive of a benefit to self, because it is inherently self-serving. That's our nature, 
That is how we are born. Again, that is our nature. On the flip side, we believers may, by the grace of God, do something truly good and selfless because we have been made new. It's our new nature to do so. Now here's the big question of the day. Can a wolf become a sheep? Can a wolf, with its nature, its intrinsic nature, become a, a sheep? Nope. Certainly not by means of its own will. And to be totally frank, even if it could, it wouldn't. Its very nature would disallow it. It would never choose on its own to become a sheep. It's not in its nature. Can an unbeliever ever decide for itself that it wants to change he or she? They want to change their very nature. Can an unbeliever ever decide for itself that they want to change their very nature? Nope. Nope. Even though there are millions of religious folks who, you know, put on a good show. With man, that's completely impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Amen? God alone has the ability to put a wolf in the grave and raise them a sheep. God alone has that ability. That's a miracle. That's what we call a miracle. And that is the crux of much of what's been coming from this pulpit regarding salvation. Being born again, as Jesus would say to Nicodemus, being born again is an act of God. To change one's very nature. We're not even inclined to do so in the nature in which we are born. To have our very nature and therefore our will changed. That which we are naturally inclined to do, to have all that change is a miracle. And it must be by the hand of God. So being born again is an act of God. Elsewhere, in Holy Scripture, this is called regeneration. Big long word for you. Regeneration by the Holy Spirit. Same thing. Up until that point of regeneration, man does maintain a free will. However, he is bounded by his very nature. That is the key, my friends. You've got to get that right. A lot of people have that wrong. Up until the point of regeneration, man does maintain a free will. However, he is bounded by his very nature. Just like a starving wolf would never choose to eat grass over a fresh kill. An unbeliever would never choose God's will over its own, the disclaimer be unless it conceived of said action as somehow good for itself. Sometimes, you know, what are they, what's the old saying? The, the, the clock 
strikes 12 twice a day. You know, sometimes the same action is done by an unbeliever and a believer, someone who's serving self and someone who's serving God. But the point is, an unbeliever would never choose God's will over its own. A born-again believer's new nature will always choose God's will over the flesh's. And this truth begins with the gospel. It all starts at the gospel. So hold that thought and give it some more consideration this week. I was thinking of writing a blog on it, but like I said, he said, no, 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 no. Put that in the beginning of this morning's message. The key there is think about the nature of a creature. The nature of all of us as we were born. And then the new nature that is supernaturally created. With that said, let's change gears. We'll pick up where we left off on Thursday. Anyone feel like being encouraged? If you want to be encouraged as a believer, read the book of Ephesians. I mean, I could just say, if you want to be encouraged, read the whole book. But especially on this topic of salvation, um, if you want to be encouraged, read the book of Ephesians. Every time I've ever read it, I walk away a new man, if that makes sense. I don't mean a new man like I'm speaking salvifically. I'm, I mean a new man, just washed clean, just a lot of the dirt and the grime and my outlook on life itself and my gratitude for God's grace is always renewed whenever I read this incredible book. So let's read that excerpt we read on Thursday. Go to Ephesians 2.1. Ephesians 2.1. If, if the gentlemen don't have a Bible, you guys got two Bibles back there? Okay. Ephesians 2, verse 1. So we read this on Thursday. I won't take as much pause with it this morning. But again, I encourage you to read all the scripture we go to on your own time. Let it sink in. If it takes me hours to create these messages for you, it should take hours at least for you to decompress them in your own soul. Ephesians 2.1 And you were what? Dead. There you go. You were dead. That's how you were born. You were dead. That was your very nature. Spiritual death. Separate from God at enmity with Him. And you were born dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power. Why would you do that? Because guess what? That was your nature. That's why you did it. Because it was your nature to walk that way. Okay, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. Why would we do that? Because that was our nature. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. In other words, this depravity was pervasive because that's how we were born. That was our nature. Therefore, it was pervasive in us. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, 
and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. That was our nature. And so in that sense, we were bound by that nature. Sure, we made free will decisions. If you want to call it free will, fine. That phrase has been so perverted and overused and pumped up and misused and misapplied by contemporary Christianity that I'm opposed to it almost. I don't want to use it. I only use it to unravel you all from any of the muck or the stickiness of these perversions that might be in your own soul. The truth of the matter is we do have a form of free will, but we are bound by our very nature. We will always choose on behalf of or because of that nature. And in that sense, we are completely bound by it. Does an unbeliever make a decision to do this or that? The answer is yeah. Every day they go out, they go to work, they go shopping, they go watch whatever. They make a choice about the TV channel they want to watch. Are those free will decisions? Last time I checked. But they are always bound by their nature. Unfortunately for them, that nature, which is evil by biblical definition, binds them also to hell, to eternal condemnation. So by nature, they're children of wrath. That's how they're born. And unless God changes them fundamentally, changes that nature, unless they're born again, they will make free will decisions from within that nature, from within the sphere of that nature, the domain of darkness, the domain of sin, that nature is bound to hell. And although they would like to free will their way out of that condemnation, they can't. Even though they might put on a good show, they can't change their very nature on their own, and therefore they're destined for hell. Okay? So that's what we see here. Verse 3 again. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Here we go. Verse 4. And remember Paul's audience here. He's speaking to believers. But God, not you, Ephesians 2, 4, but God, not you, in other words, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. God does love his own after all. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive. He's the one who did it. We didn't choose to be born again. We didn't choose regeneration. That's something God did for us. So again, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that, in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And to our previous mini-series, God receives all the glory. And then, of course, we get to this famous duo of verses that, in my opinion, is sometimes, maybe oftentimes, used out of context. But look at it, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. Just consider verses 1 and 5 again. You are dead. A dead person can't get off the ground last time I checked. A dead person can't even open their eyes last time I checked. A dead person can't hear anything last time I checked. What did... Um, what did Jesus do before he called Jesus, or Lazarus out? 
when Lazarus was dead? What did he have to do before he gave him a command? He had to raise him up. He had to make him alive again. Lazarus was dead. If, if, <laughs> the point I'm making is if he said, hey, Lazarus, come on out, and Lazarus hadn't been resurrected yet, what would Lazarus do? He would just lay there. That's the point. That's a, very, that's a type, if we would, in theology, of being born again. I will give you life, and then I'll give you commands. Sound familiar? Yeah. Look at verse 8 again. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that what? No one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so this brings us to this point up here on the board, this recurring theme in this introduction to God's salvific plan. We cannot lay claim to a single act of goodness from a state of total depravity. How could we? It's not our nature. It's not in our nature to choose for God. We are born the exact opposite our nature to choose for self. So we cannot lay claim to a single act of goodness from a state of total depravity. We are like the wolf in my opening story. That's our nature. So last time we coupled our thoughts from Ephesians 2, which we just read with the likes of Romans 5 up here on the board. Romans 5, verse 8. But God shows His love for us, again, Paul's speaking to believers. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. As the Spirit pointed out on Thursday, we must relinquish all presuppositions that we are somehow the cause of this miracle of salvation. We must relinquish all presuppositions that we, in our so-called free will, can somehow transcend our own nature that we're bounded to and make a decision that's actually good. So we have to relinquish all presuppositions that we are the cause of this miracle of salvation. Other than what God enables us to do. But we'll be getting into that. We'll get into that a little bit later. I've got a whole subsection, as I mentioned on Thursday, planned on election and predestination. Okay? So you're just going to have to suspend some of your thoughts, if you've got them, if things are, you know, sort of spiraling up in your soul and, you know, that dastardly little bugger called your flesh that you still struggle with is like, I don't like the sound of this at all. I thought I was the reason. Hmm. Well, we'll get into that what you're actually potentially supposing is that when you were dead on the ground, you somehow raised yourself up, opened your eyes to the good news about Jesus Christ, and were saved. But we'll get to that, okay? I promise you we'll get to that. And like I said on... Thursday, do yourself and me and the rest of the members here a big favor and stop using Google to search for answers. The Spirit for years now has been saying, open this book. 
Okay, there's a lot of uh, garbage on the internet about this good book. Satan's not stupid. He knows the weakness and the laziness of man. He says, oh great, I can use this new tool called Google to search for things that I really have never studied out in Holy Scripture for myself. Search for things like, I don't know, election and predestination. And then have my mind completely run amok because some bozo wrote a blog about how it's this or that. And the whole thing appeals to your human flesh, so you chew it up like a carrot. Just do us all a favor. Do yourself a favor. Don't do that thing. Stay off of Google when you go looking for doctrines. God gave you a gracious gift. If you're here this morning, it's this particular message. How about that? Like I said on Thursday, listen, we have hundreds of message, messages, probably about a thousand blogs now from this pulpit. There's more than enough, five books I think, there's more than enough content coming from this pulpit for you to chew on than to go searching on Google for things you're too lazy to read for yourself in Holy Scripture. Do you understand? Do yourself a favor. Stay off of Google. Please. A lot of garbage out there. We'll get there. It's great if you're really thirsty and hungry for the truth. That's a wonderful thing. But God's timing is perfect. Satan's always going to want to try to give you some garbage before God gives you the truth. So don't let your impatience get the best of you or your partiality to um, appease your human flesh get the best of you. Fair enough? Okay. For now, here's the perspective he wants us to have up here on the board. Proper perspective when studying salvation, we must heed Solomon's wisdom. What did Solomon say? At the end of his great book in Ecclesiastes, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. That's it. Fear God and keep his commandments. Okay? Raise your hand if you've got every commandment in this book memorized. Stupid question, right? Then I guess what? You have a lot more to do here than on Google. Read your Bible. Spend your time reading your Bible. Fear God. Keep His commandments. That is your whole duty to God. Fair enough? Okay. We are slaves given duties by our masters. A master, excuse me. We don't always know the master's plans. He gives us faith instead. You might go to the Bible a hundred times and go, I just can't find that thing. Do angels really have belly buttons? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's see what Google has to say. Oh, yes. Oh, no. You idiot. You idiot. Let me go on Facebook. Oh. Let me start a trolling war on Facebook. Oh, I think angels have their belly buttons. Send. You idiot. Don't you know anything? Cut it out. What do you expect? If God didn't disclose it in Holy Scripture, and you've literally read the entire Bible back and front, and you know it's not there, then guess what? You ready? You're not supposed to know. A little thing called faith. Imagine that. Imagine that. A little thing called faith. But most people say, well, I don't know if it's in the Bible, and I'm too lazy, so I'm going to go to Google. First figure out if it's in the Bible or not. Ready? Simply put, according to Solomon even, up here on the board, the job description of a slave. You ready? Not difficult. Obey your master. Obey your master. Let's, Jesus, let's read Jesus' words again. Go to John 15, 14. John 15, 14. That's your job. Just obey.
Fear God, keep His commandments. Sounds pretty simple. But we had this too. So we see a certain intimacy here that's given to Jesus' disciples. John 15, 14. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants. That's that Greek word doulos. Also translated slave elsewhere. For the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. These things, and this is if you to read the entire chapter here in context, these things, all of it, I command you. Right? So we're still under the command of Jesus, our master. He might call us friend, but we're still slaves. These things I command you so that you will love one another. And as I mentioned on Thursday, obedience to our master always ushers us into the sphere of love. These commandments, the ones your flesh goes berserk over, the ones your flesh does not want to accept, they always bring you into the sphere of love. They're for your own good. That's the point. Commandments are beautiful. I am so glad, right, that he gives us an abundance of commandments, that he shows us the way. He doesn't say, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. He also shows us as believers, how do you stay in your swim lane, right? How do you not, how do you, you know, it's like, remember when you go bowling when you're a little kid and they put up those rails? You could never go in the gutter. It's like that. Commandments are like rails. They keep you from going in the gutter. Does that make sense? And it's a beautiful thing. Is that not a gift? If you're a little kid, what do you do without the rails? You bowl a zero. Or maybe a one. Because somehow the you know, thing's going like two miles an hour down the alley. It's like, and you like, it starts, you know, doing, and it goes, and knocks over one at the end. You might bowl a one or a ten if you're really skilled. So you're really happy that those guards are up to keep you out of the gutter. It's the same thing with the commandments of God. I am very, very, very super happy and uh, blessed, as are you, to have the commandments of God and to know. The more I know, the better it gets. The more we know, the tighter those rails come in. Right? We bowl more strikes in life. That's a really good thing. A slave on friendly terms with their master is still subordinate to them. The master is in no way obligated to share every last detail or reason for his choices. And that's where it gets uncomfortable again, because we want to know, don't we? We want to know. It's like when we're teenagers and we torture our parents. Why? Why do I have to do that? Why do I have to be in at 9 a.m., 9 p.m.? Why? Why do I have to be in bed at 7.30? Because you're four, right? You'd stay up all night and you'd be so miserable, you'd be a wretch the next day. Trust me on this one. No. You go huffing off. (laughs) Anyways, the master is in no way obligated to share every last detail or reason for his choices. That's what the Spirit's been impressing on us. That's the perspective we want. We don't even get to get into salvific uh, plan of God yet. He's saying, before you even get there, you have to understand this perspective. You have to approach me fearfully, properly, appropriately. You're not going to come to me with your own agenda. You're not going to come to my salvific plan that I architected from eternity past nonetheless to try to substantiate something ridiculous and evil as your so-called free will that perversion that you've held on to for years, possibly. You're not going to approach me that way because you're going to get it wrong. You're going to open up your Bible, like the bald guy said, and you're going to read your Bible with an agenda. And you're going to read what you want to read. You're going to read into the Bible what you want to believe is true. Can't do that. Not if you want to get it right. Not if you want to get it right. There are still many, many reasons for God's actions 
that we will never understand here on earth. How could we? Honestly, your brain's too little. My brain's too little. I can't understand everything that he does. I mean, geez, I've only been living for 52 years. How could I possibly know? Here's an analogy to help. And anytime I give a, an analogy, I, I ask for your forgiveness because nothing is perfect. Okay? But it, hopefully it brings a point home for you. Your boss says to you, I need you to do Sally's job today, okay? You know that Sally's been feeling a little inadequate at work lately. So you ask your boss, why? Is Sally okay? Is she going to feel like I'm doing or taking her job from her? Your boss says, don't worry about it. And hurries off to tend to other important business. Unsatisfied with the reasoning your boss just gave you, you text Sally, are you okay? The boss just asked me to do your job for you. Sally, just learning of this, spends the rest of her day worried she's going to get phased out because there have been a lot of cutbacks lately. So you decide to do what the boss asked, but you do a poor job of it on purpose to help save Sally's job. You're afraid if you do too good of a job, your boss is going to say, see, Sally's not worth it, see you later. So you do a poor job on purpose to help save Sally. The next day, the big boss from corporate stops by the office to do an evaluation on your boss. They see the terrible result of your purposely shoddy work and decide to let your boss go. It fires him. The next day, as your boss is cleaning out his office, he asks, what happened? Why'd you do a poor job like that? And you explain your reasoning. And he responds with, that's too bad because you just cost me my job and Sally the promotion I was planning on surprising her with. He continues, you see, it's too late now, but I was asking you to do Sally's job so that I could have her showcase her talents on another project in order to justify her promotion to the big boss. However, the big boss was so indignant that I got let go and Sally's good labor was never even seen. And so you walk away dejected. What's the moral of the story? It's still on the board. That's the moral of the story. Obey your master. That's the moral of the story. Because you don't know everything that's going on. Can slaves freely make decisions within the operating envelope their master provides? Yeah. But that's pretty much where it ends. You let the authorities in your life do their job, and you, fo you focus on doing yours. Don't worry about how fair, there's that word again, how fair you think you or others are being treated. You mind your own business. Right? I'm thinking of, um, you know, when the disciples are like, well, 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 well wait a minute, there's, there's wheat and tares? Yeah. Should we, like, you know, get rid of the tares? No, that's not your job. You just keep sowing the seed. Whatever grows up, that's between me and them. Whatever doesn't grow up, that's between them and I. You, your duty, the so-called Great Commission, is to sow the seed. You don't know who's elect, who's not elect. You don't know who's going to believe and who isn't going to believe. But that, guess what, ready? It's not your job. So stop pretending like it is. And stop saying, well, that's not fair. You don't even know what the hell you're talking about. What 
gives you the right to question me. I'm the creator here. This is my plan. Not yours. Mind your own business. Amen. <laughs> Benjamin's like... <laughs> Here's our principle from last time. Up here on the board. This so-called free will. Slaves may suppose, even agree amongst themselves, that their so-called free will gives them the power to influence or even modify their master's plans. However, God's decree was ordained before human history, sovereignly set in stone. Where this becomes incredibly important to understand is with regard to the gospel of Jesus Christ. God saves those whom he so desires. That's a fact. That's, literal, that's clearly stated in Holy Scripture. God saves those whom he so desires to save. Does he not have that right? I mean, he is the creator. He is the sovereign after all. I mean, should, he, should the tables be turned? Should man tell God what he should do? I don't think so. Think about it this way. He's the only one capable of and so inclined to convert a wolf into a sheep. He's the only one capable of and so inclined to convert a wolf into a sheep. Yeah, there are a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing, but that doesn't make them sheep. Mm -hmm. It's not our business to question him up here on the board. John 6.44 No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Now, how does that work? I gave you the example of Lazarus earlier. How does that work? How does a dead person magically open their eyes and see the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ, and irresistibly come to him? How does that happen if they're dead on the floor? It does not. What has to precede this is regeneration. A wolf's not even inclined. Given the opportunity, a wolf is never going to say, I really want to be a sheep. That's not its nature. An unbeliever never says, I really want to be a believer. They don't even like God. They're too preoccupied with themselves. This is what this is saying. This is Jesus right here. Any questions? No one comes to me unless the Father draws them. Any questions? Unless Jesus is a flat-out liar, this is the truth. Now, your human flesh is like, I don't like this. Time out. This just doesn't seem fair. Why did he pull me and not Uncle Jimmy? Ask God when you see him. Honestly, you want me to answer that for you? I can't even answer that for myself. I'm just glad he did. How about that? How about that's my business? My business is to know and be encouraged that I'm saved. My business, my duty after that is to sow the seed. Can I distinguish between wheat and tares? Not really. I might have my unctions, but at the end of the day, that's God's business, not mine. That's why I will never definitively say, oh, that person's saved. Oh, that person's definitely not saved. Oh, that person's saved. Oh, that person's definitely not saved. That's not my business. That's not my business. I know what theology says. I know what the Bible says. The Bible says that a good tree can only bear good fruit. A bad tree can only bear bad fruit. And vice versa, they don't bear the fruit of each other. That I know is true. So I might see fruit in someone and go, hmm, let me give them the gospel just in case. Let me sow that seed yet again. See if God wants to deal with them some more. I don't know. I don't know. And you know what? You ready? Drum roll. Faith. I'm okay with that. Faith. I have faith to know that God will do always what is just and righteous and good to his glory. How about that? That I believe. 
Do I believe man is born with a free will? Yep. Do I think that free will will ever choose for God? Nope. Not, in, not until God draws him, which begins with what? Regeneration. I've got to open this guy's eyes up first. Hmm. So that's Jesus' word, John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. So Jesus' words here annihilate the flesh's so-called free will claim to glory in salvation. Oh, no, 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 no. I chose. Yeah, you chose once your eyes were opened to the glory of Jesus Christ. Once your very nature was capable of choosing, I agree, you did choose. So in that sense, yeah, your free will was intact. But guess what? Your free will was now supplanted from one place to another. From a place where you were in complete darkness to all of a sudden you had light. And when God showed you Jesus Christ, guess what? You irresistibly chose him instead of for self. That's what the Bible says. Your human flesh doesn't like it, does it? You know, you know, you want that claim. You want to be, at the end of the day, the human flesh wants to stake a claim to salvation. It wants to say, man is sovereign. Yeah, I know. I know, folks. Been there, done that. Jesus' words here annihilate the flesh's so-called free will claim to glory in salvation. No matter how much a person believes they are the primitive cause of their own salvation, it's simply not true. It's just not true. As we just noted in Ephesians 2 and Romans 5, we are dead, far too weak to help ourselves. Up here on the board, John 6.63, or 6.63, excuse me. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. Uh, any questions? Who gives life? The Spirit does. The flesh is no help at all. None. That makes total sense. And that's congruent with the rest of Holy Scripture that says, you were born dead. How could you possibly be helped doing anything? If I go roll out a dead person in a casket out here and say, hey, can you help me pull some weeds out here? It's getting a little weedy. How much help are they going to be? None. Now, if God resurrects them and says, hey, go and put some to work. Okay. I got another worker. But unless God performs that miracle, guess what? That person is no help at all. They can't even help themselves. That's the point in salvation. Yeah. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, period. Go to John 3, 1. John 3, verse 1. John 3, verse 1. So we're going to flesh all this out in greater detail. He's just, again, trying to get you to that place where you approach God's salvific plan, where you approach the gospel of Jesus Christ properly. You do not have an agenda. You do not impose what you think is fair and right, what your human sensibilities find palatable. You don't approach the Word of God that way. That's called arrogance. You approach the Word of God in complete awe and respect and humility. Yeah. And so that's what he's trying to shake out of us, you see. He's like, if we're, gonna, if we're going to study this thing out in great detail, and we will, this is months, by the way. We're just like in the, we're just teasing the front end of the introduction. We're talking months of labor here. Phenomenal labor. But he keeps doing this. We're on part three already. And he's saying, I don't even want to get there yet with you. And all I can tell you from my perspective, from my experience as a shepherd here, 
is that someone in here is dragging their feet. Someone in here isn't yet convinced of this idea that I just taught. Someone in here is still dragging their feet. And so what he's doing you is, for you is a very big favor. He's saying, okay, we'll take one more Sunday on this then. Until your arrogance subsides. Until you stop trying to come to my word with your ridiculous agenda. What you want to be true. Because if that's true, then your precious little viper of a kid who supposedly grew up and was saved when they were six or something, they say a little prayer, they went to church for a little while. If, 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 if this is all true, then they're probably not even saved. It's very possible they're going to go to hell. Hey, listen, what do you want me to tell you? You want me to lie to you like every other schmuck does behind pulpits nowadays? You want me to lie and, and, and try to make this say something it doesn't? Just to what? Appeal to your human flesh? Go home. You want the truth? This is the truth. You come to the Word of God in humility. Humility. And that is it. That is it, my friends. My job is to get the heck out of the way. And when necessary, do what I just did. A big favor. Take the time, keep bringing it up, and say, listen, that thing that you're struggling with needs to be put aside. That preconception that you're struggling with, in my world, that's called arrogance, but whatever, it needs to be put aside. John 3, 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher to come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Why? He's blind. That's how he was born. That's his very nature. His will, his mind, everything is against God. That's how we're born. We are born depraved. That's why we have to be born again, which is a miracle. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Verse 6, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And this is akin to Jesus' words. Hold your thumb right there. Go to Luke 6.43. Luke 6.43. Okay? Hold your thumb. We're going to go back. Luke 6.43. <clears throat> Luke 6, 43, For no good tree bears bad fruit, okay, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Okay, so Jesus laid down the law that says, a tree bears fruit after its own kind. If the tree is evil, it bears evil fruit. If it's good, it bears good fruit. Okay, go back to John 3, 6. That's akin to what's in view here. John 3, 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Now, this is the crux of this morning's message in many ways. Verse 8, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Do you see what's going on there? Let me read it again. Let's read it real slow. You ready? Verse 8. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit, God, is the one who regenerates us. The Holy Spirit, God, is the one who regenerates us. If we are born spiritually dead, then this is very good news indeed. However, for the person still clinging to their idol, quote, free will, this is very bad news because their scam has been brought to light. Their scam is brought to light. And those who are in darkness hate the light because the light exposes their deeds. And so what do they do? They avoid the light. They go on Google instead. They don't open their Bibles. They don't go to the Bible in humility. They go in arrogance with an agenda. They look for ways that they can twist Holy Scripture so that it says something different. So that somehow, some way, substantiates this idol they call free will. Because they, damn it, they want to be the sovereign in their life. Captain, oh captain, my captain. I'm the captain of my destiny. No, you're not. Mm. They don't like the idea. They think this is, this is bad news to their own theology. They don't like, because what Jesus just said is, guess what? You're not in control. It's the Spirit who regenerates. You don't know where the wind comes from or where it's going. Amen? So what makes you think you know where the Spirit's going to regenerate? You don't. That's the whole point. That's not the perspective we're supposed to have about Holy Scripture. We're just supposed to say, thank you for being so gracious on me. Now let me go sow some seed. Let me go do my duty. Instead of not minding my own business, sticking my nose into areas of business that are yours and yours alone, I can't even tell where the wind comes from. I don't even know where it starts. I don't know where it's going. How could I possibly have the audacity to question you who chooses sovereignly? The only thing I can ever do when I get into that business is mess the whole thing up by lying to someone, let's say. Oh, sweetie, you're totally saved. Now run along. Did you say that prayer? Oh, you're good. Did you go to the front of the church one day and say, oh, I accept Jesus into my heart? Oh, you're good. You're totally good. That's what happens when you start lying to people. You don't know, so stop. I don't ever want to hear anybody ever say that ever again, not in my presence, because I'll probably call you out. Don't say this one's saved or that one's not. How the heck do you know? The only person you'll ever know that for and be encouraged about is yourself. And that's between you and the Lord as it is, which means no one else gets to judge that for you. So anyways, the person still clinging to their idle free will, when they read verse 8, it's very bad news because the light illuminates the darkness, and you know, how great is their darkness when they think they're in the light. And then the light really comes on, they're like, oh, I don't like that. It means if Jesus' words are correct, of course they are, then their claim to glory in their false gospel has just been blown up. So here's some perspective from another pastor I thought I'd share with you up here on the board. Pastor John Piper. Some of you know who John Piper is. John 3.8. And when you hear Jesus say, the Spirit blows where it wills, don't hear Him taking from you the will that you treasure, but hear Him giving to you eyes to see Christ as your treasure. It's just a perspective change. You see? The flesh thinks it's losing something, so it's, mm, this is upsetting news to the flesh. But I want to be sovereign. The new creature, the one that God imparted to you, 
loves reading this passage because it really does enforce the fact that God is sovereignly in control. So for you, it's very encouraging. This would be evidence of your own salvation, by the way, that you would have an affinity for something like verse 8. If that bothers you viscerally, you need to step back and say, well, where am I at? Like Paul would say in, uh, what is it? First or Second Corinthians 2.13, I forget what it is. Examine yourself, test yourselves, and see if you're actually in the faith. Examine yourself, test yourselves. See if you're actually in the faith. If this bothers you so much, maybe you need to ask yourself a bigger question. I don't know. That's between you and the Lord, right? I'm certainly not going to say you're saved and not saved. God is holy and gracious, and His choices are perfect. We as slaves, as clay, if you want to borrow from Romans 9, as clay, as humans, do not have the right to question Him. The Spirit blows where it wills, meaning we cannot control Him. We may have questions, and as friends or believers of Christ, we may find answers in the Bible. And God invites us to do that thing. However, there's a difference between having questions within the realm of fear and respect of the Lord and questioning the Lord. Those are two different things. It's one thing to have questions. It's another thing to question Him and His decisions. In the prior sense, we are humbly seeking truth, as Jesus would state up here on the board, Matthew 6, 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. However, we do not have the right to question God's choices regarding something like election up here on the board, Romans 9, 20, but who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Who the heck are you? Your job, your duty, is to seek me. I'm thinking of uh, at the end there, end of Jesus' ministry again, when Peter's like, hey, what about him, though? You're saying, I'm going to die a martyr's death. What about John? And Jesus says, mind your own business. Seriously, right now, this is where we're going, Peter? You're worried about John over here? Mind your own business. It's not your business what I do with him. It's just like it's not our business what he does with anyone he's ever created. So here's the key perspective in our introduction to God's salvific plan up here on the board. Grace is not a slave to what man thinks is fair. Now, a lot of you need to chew on that for quite a while, I think. Grace is not a slave to what man thinks is fair. God just doesn't throw out a bucket of grace and then we get to dole it out to whom we think it's correct to dole it out to. That's not how it works. It's not a, it's not a cookie jar. Do you understand? It's not a cookie jar. We don't get to take that cookie jar off of God's lap and hand it to somebody else just because they said some prayer or just because they assumed they were now going to heaven. We don't get to do that. Grace is not a slave to what man thinks is fair. We can't say to God, in other words, you have to save this person because that's what's fair. You have to regenerate this person because that's what's fair. You have to open up their eyes and their ears so that they can see and hear the gospel because that's what's fair. You don't have that right. That's what's fair. What's fair, everybody? Hell. You want to get to down to what's really fair in this world? We all go to hell now. So the fair question is off the table. If God did what was fair... We'd all be in hell right now, immediately. If you really want to know the truth about fairness, you don't get to pluck out something as gracious as grace and mercy and then use it as a whip on God and say, I demand that you be fair by my standards. You don't have that right, oh piece of clay, oh little man or woman. You don't have that right. The audacity 
of supposing such a thing is blasphemous. You don't have that right. End of story. That's the point. We overstep our bounds. We do it all the time with the gospel. Grace is not a slave to what man thinks is fair. God uses grace. You ready? You want to know the truth about grace? God uses grace to accomplish His will. To His glory, not man's. That's the essence, the tool that God uses to accomplish His will. Does man once regenerated find God's will irresistible? Yeah. Like I said earlier, the new creature, that's all a new creature wants to do, is to be pleasing to God. I taught a series on this not so long ago about grace up here on the board. Man's perversion of God's grace. Man in his fleshly desire for control supposes wrongly that he is able to seize God's grace as he would any object and then use it as a means to his own ends even supposing he can put God to task with it. Let me say it again. Man in his fleshly desire for control supposes wrongly that he is able to seize God's grace as he would any other object and then use it as a means to his own ends. Even supposing he can put God to task with it. So dwell on that. Grace is something God sovereignly chooses to bestow on whomever he wishes. He is under no obligation whatsoever to anyone to do so. Is that fair? I mean, he is the sovereign God of the universe, after all. Can he not choose? Is that not Romans 9, folks? Can he not choose to bestow grace on whomever, mercy on whomever he wants? Of course. He's God. Do we have a right to question that? Of course not. Because he's God. So of course it's fair. Because God is always fair. And always just. And always righteous. So indeed it is fair. Especially when we know we all deserve hell. That's what's truly fair. And I recommend you read this book again. Up here on the board. It's on the website. But... It's hyperlinked to chapter 3, so this is an excerpt. To chap- I recommend you read chapter 3, Mercy Demands. It's just a little subsection, maybe a couple of pages long. But go to the website, you can find this book. Covert Arrogance, Hiding Out in Plain Sight. Chapter 3, Mercy Demands. Quote, Receivers of mercy have no inherent right to demand it. For if they did, it would no longer be defined as mercy. But rather as something that is due them. This is arrogance, most often covert. You don't have the right to say God has to have mercy on me. Otherwise, it would be no longer mercy. It would be something that you earned. But we just read in Holy Scripture several times, and it's, the Bible's filled with it. Lest anyone should boast, this is by the grace of God and Him alone. You have nothing to demand of God. If you demand He's fair and He listened to you, you're in hell. Oh, because that's what's fair. You follow? That's the point. We don't get to use God's mercy as a whip on him. And that's why Paul goes through that arduous process in Romans 9 and forward of saying, time out here, man. Who the heck are you? I'm going to do whatever I want to do. I'm going to save whoever I want to save. I'm going to have mercy on whomever I want to have mercy on. I'm going to show compassion on whomever I feel like showing compassion on. And you have, my little one, nothing to say about it. Just be glad I give it to you. That's where we ended on Thursday, and I've got to end. Wow, I didn't know we were going this long must be up here preaching or something. (laughs) Again, up here on the board, I'll stop in a minute.
Grace is not a slave to what man thinks is fair. So that's been the clearing of the air before we even get into salvation proper. This is what the Lord wanted to do for us. Let's clear the air of all this garbage that contemporary Christianity keeps propping up as truth. It's garbage. Okay? Man doesn't get to put their version of fairness on God. And then in doing so, you know, because the end justifies the means, they put the sovereign act of salvation in the hands of man. Yeah. You don't have that right to do that. Grace, listen, grace is anything God chooses. Listen. Grace is anything God chooses to do above sending us all to hell immediately. That, my friends, is the perspective you need to approach this doctrine with. This isn't some uh, negotiation, right? This isn't some negotiation with God. He's saying, this is non-negotiable. I've decreed what I've decreed. This is my will in view, not yours, little one. This is non-negotiable. Boy, does our human flesh hate that. Amen? Oh, yeah, we're always trying to do that thing. I always think of, do you remember that movie, The End, with Burt Reynolds? When he goes out and he's going to go kill himself and he goes to drown himself, he's like two miles offshore, and then he changes his mind, and he comes out and he's like, I want to live! Right? And he's like, God, I'll give you 90% of everything I make as long as you may let me come to shore. And then the closer he gets to shore, he's like, I know I said 90%. What I really meant was 80%. Right? And then he gets on shore and he's like, I'll give you 10%. Right? And he goes, well, you don't want 10%? Then don't take it. I'll keep it all for myself. And he walks off. Right? It's not a negotiation. That's how man, that's ridiculous man is. To think you even have that kind of negotiation with God is ridiculous. And that's the perspective. Okay? That, my friends, is the perspective that you have to have when you come to God's salvific plan. Amen? All right, let's bar Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us this time this morning to fellowship together, to break bread, the very bread of life, to hear the truth that sets us free. Thank you for keeping us humble, and thank you for whatever faith you've given each one of us as individuals. We just ask for your blessings as we take the things we've learned back to the privacy of our own souls, our homes even, and then you will be done out to a world that needs the truth so desperately, Father. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Thank you.